I see people eating. All right, everybody, welcome to the Beyond Lambdas panel at JFocus. We are the, the lunch entertainment while you guys enjoy the, the fine JFocus cuisine. And with me, I have some of the experts in JVM and, and Java language design with me. So we're gonna, we're gonna take a look at what's coming up in Java 8 and then look a little farther and see what's, what's beyond. So first, um, some introductions for our um, panelists. I'm gonna let you guys self-introduce. Martin? Uh, hi, I'm actually not a language designer or a JVM expert, but I am uh, a major end user of Java and JVM languages, so that, I'm gonna have my opinions on that. You're, you're, you're being unusually humble today, Martin. <laughs> uh, I'm Morris Naftalin. I don't think I'm, I don't consider myself an expert on anything very much, but I write books about things so that I can try and understand them, and currently I'm writing a book about lambdas. Uh, I'm Marcus Doggerin. I work on the Java language team uh, these last few years. I've mainly been focusing on the JVM as a polyglot platform and uh, dynamic languages on the JVM. I evoke dynamic performance, the NAS or script engine, stuff like that. I used to be the uh, uh, chief architect for the JITS and the, the JRocket JVM uh, way back when. Okay, so the first person who did not belittle themselves and say they were not a JVM guru. I think we have our, a winner here. I'm not the Java programmer, though. <laughs> you're not a Java programmer. You're a <laughs> C and C++ guy, C and C++ right? hacker yeah. who just happens to enable all the rest of us to hack. Venka? Well, Venka Subramaniam. I consider myself a student of computer science. Uh, I like uh, programming. I like learning about languages. So I play with uh, maybe about 10 different languages, Java, of course, being one of them. Very good. All right, so I want to ask you guys, for the, for the upcoming Java 8 release, there's, there's quite a lot of new features and stuff in it. What, what are you most excited about seeing coming out for the Java community? The two biggest things are the uh, Lambdas and the Stream API and Invoke Dynamic. Invoke Dynamic. And that pretty much sums it up. So was it hey. Invoke Dynamic was in 7. It was, but the implementation had a couple of flaws, and uh, it wasn't complete. And uh, we really haven't seen many applications of it before uh, Java 8. Very good. So the biggest application of it is Lambdas. Well, and JRuby, maybe. Yes. Charlie yeah. Nutty would probably and Nazworn and other engines. People have really started to yeah. use it right yeah. now. Yeah. Okay. So with the changes for Invoke Dynamic in, in 8, it's actually getting practical use with the JVM language community as well as the Java yes. APIs. And there's still performance work ongoing, and you'll see eight update releases, uh, with, uh, which will be even better at Evoke Dynamic, all to work towards the long-term goal of the JVM as a polyglot platform. Nice. We ditch the J and just say the VM in the future. That's, I mean, that's the <laughs> dream goal. There. Very yeah. That would be very cool. Uh, all right, anyone else want to pitch in? Um, I'm also going to add the, the G1 garbage collector. Um, as of, uh, it has been backported to, to 7U, um, to, to 7, I should say. Uh, but the version in 8 uh, doesn't crash my JVM, which is nice. <laughs> and um, yeah, the, the sort of early experiments we've been doing with it, uh, especially on larger heaps, um, it's, it's performing actually really nicely. So. Cool. And, and I would add, uh, you know, in addition to these as a consequence, more, more, the, uh, more so than anything else, is the evolution of the JDK itself to support some of these Lambda expressions and features. So I think the most, uh, the most interesting thing about it is, um, I'm, for me, it's not so much the technical aspects, but the culture change that uh, Lambdas are going to bring. I mean, there's a big push going on to take, Java, uh, to take Java forward, which it hasn't gone forward for a long time. And, we are, and we're going to see it becoming more like we're going to introduce the habits of functional programming to a lot of people who haven't known about them before. And I think that's going to be really interesting to see how that works. Yeah, I totally agree. I think the biggest change is going to be not you know, as much in the language as it's in the minds of the programmers mm. using it. Mm. So you, you're going you're gonna to take advantage of, of lambdas in your C code now? Uh, <laughs> wish I could. No. I've written a lot of Java code these last two years, which is a new experience for me, like parts of the Nazhorn uh, <laughs> engine, for instance. But, uh, nice. And that is, like Java C, we always have to be one version behind the current Java for bootstrapping reasons. So yeah. I'm afraid I still Java 7 there and in Java C. But, um, with anything I rewrite in a functional style with Lambda, so I get rid of 60% of the code mass, and that's not, a, uh, that's an exaggeration. So I'm, I'm really excited about it as well. 
uh, being an old lisp guy as well, it's I mean it's it's not everything you would want beautifully, but it looks like Java and it makes Java easier. So okay, so we we've been chatting a lot about about lambdas, and so two two comments. The first is I think I think Stephen Colborn is probably rolling around and screaming because nobody's actually mentioned his hard work into the date and time API. Oh, that's right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's a really bad oversight. <laughs> well, uh, that is the, uh, you're absolutely right. But I wouldn't call that really exciting in the, in the same kind of way, mainly because Joe time has been there for such a long time already. And I Perhaps. don't think I know anybody. It is heroic, though, who, that someone finally, oh, finally did that. Anybody oh, who, who writes yeah, real production yeah, code yeah, against yeah, the yeah, really old yeah, date and time yeah. API. Yeah. Yeah. Deserves all the credit for that. Yeah, so. absolutely. I think the, the London Java community, some of you guys helped out with testing. Yeah, uh, and Richard Warburton, who's actually yeah. here, was one of the committers on JSR 3.10. And uh, yeah, we held a bunch of hack days to help shape the API and things. And uh, I can't tell you how much of a joy it was to use a date and, API, date and time API that actually made sense oh, and yeah. you know dealt with <laughs> things like time zones properly. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fantastic. Okay, but you know, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna discount everything you guys have said so far, because Java 8 that's like a a March thing, and that's that's so close it doesn't even matter. I don't even know why you guys are giving talks on lambdas. Everybody knows about it. Yeah. I mean, what we should be talking about is what's coming up in future Java versions. So I, I like your vision. What? I like oh. your vision. <laughs> I, I agree with it. When people invite me to conferences now, I want me to talk about eight features. I'm like, oh, let's so 2009. I mean, to <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So you know, we're obviously we're not we're not product managers. We're not going to set a roadmap for for Java on stage here. But if if you guys could pick features or capabilities which you think the Java community, the Java developers really need, what? If you were the Java king, what would you be adding to Java to make a difference? Or taking away? Yeah. Uh, we talking well, strictly the Java language now, or um, JDK, or are we talking the JVM? We 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 are not going to restrict and limit you. So yes. I'll start with the Up big elephant those. in the room, and the big elephant in the room is how much we all love generics. <laughs> and uh, I, think, I think what we really need is a revisit of generics and re, uh, true reification available in the language. I would, I would say that's one of the key things to consider. Do, do, do yeah, so, so one of the things which I, which lambdas and some of the new language features, the stream APIs in particular, force you to do, it forces you to be really good at understanding and applying generics. And Java developers, it's been way, a long time since 1.5 came out, and folks have not gotten any better at it. Like we were, we were looking at the stream API and you know, fig, trying to figure out, oh, why is there a question extends question super T everywhere? <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, well, actually, you're never going to pass the super class in, but because of the special generic type rules, you have to like increase the bound to handle interfaces where you could have possibly multiple super class interfaces applied to it and. It makes perfect sense when you know the details of the generics implementation, but for the average developer, it's not very intuitive. Uh, that's a fair point. The, the generics uh, part of the language spec is probably one of the most mind-numbingly difficult ones to, to read and understand, and uh, I'm not actually too sure Although if anyone really gets I don't it think, I don't think, Unlike Scala, generics are not Turing complete. Right. <laughs> yeah, which is really <laughs> scary. <laughs> I okay. would say value types, uh, which enables a lot of other things. I would say uh, more polyglot stuff, because that's where my brain is, like uh, strong tail call optimizations tail in the yeah. JVM. Yeah, yeah. We definitely You're need making that. all the JVM language guys happy. Yeah, <laughs> we definitely want yeah. those. For the JVM architecture, we need fewer GCs. There's like still six of them, which <laughs> depend on each other in a complete graph. And there's two JITs, which make a quadratic test matrix. And like we need to unify and re-architecture stuff there to make it simpler and faster. And that's on, I mean, that's on a roadmap, but it's uh, not going to change any public API for anyone. It's just uh, us down in the basement have to worry about stuff like that a, a lot. Uh, some of the architectural choices that were made in Hotspot are at the end of the road now, like probably the C2 JIT, which pretty much everyone, including market colleges, is it's time to do something to be able to get further. Uh, <laughs> implementing an optimization and it takes like several weeks instead of several days, which it would in LLVM or in the old J-Rocket or in pretty much every, anything else. So we, we're having some uh, issues there after the years. 
Yeah. yeah. So We've been morbidly afraid to change stuff in the JVM because of post-traumatic stress syndrome from Sun or whatever, but that's <laughs> going to have to start happening now. Yeah. So I guess, you know, you kind of have a good perspective as a, like a JVM guru who came in to work on Hotspot. Yes. And having worked on another JVM architecture, so is there, is there specific technical debt which you're looking at where like this is an area we really want to improve? Uh, there is specific technical debt, um, both in the JVM and in the infrastructure, but both of these are being addressed and we are seeing a light at the end of the tunnel. But to me, in 2010, it was like being teleported back into medieval times when we looked at what the sun had. <laughs> so. Nice. Um, but I think we're getting better all the time. Yeah. <laughs> I think one of the things I, I definitely want to see, and I've already seen some JDK enhancement proposals going, is just getting Java closer to the bare metal uh, or closer to the native code. Um, mm -hmm. So I think we're seeing some proposals about foreign function interfaces. Uh, Very good point. Where, you know, uh, that sort of area where hopefully we can start to get Java to safely talk to uh, the native aspects um, instead of using some misc unsafe um, peek and poke, which is just dangerous and awful. Um, but there's a lot of safe things that can now be done and to make that available to the day-to-day -day developer and get you know, some real low-level performance out of the JVM uh, would be fantastic. A big need for it where, where I'm from in London anyway, in the financial sort of services space. Yeah, so you see lots of frameworks cropping up out of the financial industry yeah. for extremely high transaction, high throughput. Low latency, yeah. Yeah, so on and so forth. So that, that level of optimization would give you guys an edge up in your implementation? Yeah, and it would be great to do it more safely instead of you know, using these kind of undocumented, unsupported, you know, some misc unsafe type, type mechanisms. Um, yeah, it would just be better for everyone in general. Cool. Well, You're yeah. probably never going to see a generic public peek and poke API. Has. No, no, I, I, <laughs> I wouldn't want to give that to people either. Right? That's just, you know, you're just asking for sig faults. Uh, You'd be surprised there. how many people do. But, yeah, um, I, I know some of them, yeah. Yeah. And the other thing that we're going to need for um, high performance down the line is going to be to, be to make better use of the massively multi-core multi architectures that we're going to get coming up. So, I mean, increasing the uh, management of uh, immutable data, increasing the amount of immutability that we have, is yeah, gonna, so gonna, is, in long term, it's going to be a big issue. Lambdas are a step in the right direction because as a programming style, they encourage you to be do a functional style, but they yeah. don't enforce immutability. I don't think, well, th we, th nobody's ever going to enforce immutability in Java. I mean, it's a blue color language and, uh, yeah. and it's going to stay that way, I think. But it, it's going to be interesting to see how far it can be pushed in that direction. Yeah, I mean, I think collection literals is one of the things that's being proposed, which, which would be a great, great step in, in the right direction. Well, there's a bit of debate going on about whether that should be mutable or immutable by default and things, but um, I think every small step we, we take mm, to, to make yeah. things immutable, yeah. so the, the new date and time libraries in Java 8, for example, actually yeah. you know, are immutable by default, which is a, a great leap forward. Um, I know yeah. IDE authors who try to supply a coding style that enforces immutability for your Java code. Mm. Um, I've, seen, I've seen some work on that, yeah. which is, I mean, would enable you to use a subset that actually is immutable, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. as you said blue color language, statement based but functional. Yeah. I put on a blue color, especially for yeah. today. <laughs> today yeah. I, I did want to go back to so the you're, reified. You're one of the guys. <laughs> yeah. I did want to go back to the reified generics, actually. I, is there not a concern there that that could be potentially damaging for uh, JVM language interoperability? Because if the runtime information is actually kept, it's going to be a lot harder for other languages to poke in and interrupt with Java uh, in, a, in a performant manner. So I, I don't know if people have put thought into that. It's, it's beyond my realm of expertise, but... So you're, you're thinking reification might be bad for... Yeah, exactly. Interoperability. Yes. Yeah, tr true reification might, might be bad, because how, how is JavaScript going to be able to interpret what a, what a, you know, a, a dog object does at runtime when it's been strongly yeah. typed? Well, I think the static type languages certainly can make use of it. I think dynamic type languages at the programmer level may not enforce the type information, but I don't think once it gets converted to bytecode, it makes no difference after all. It's the compiler issue, not the runtime issue, isn't it? Yeah, Reification leads to a lot of uh, can of worms in the runtime as well. I mean, it can be implemented, but every object header would have to have a reification type. And I mean, I can I can imagine that there'll be performance issues getting it uh, getting it efficient uh, language-wise. There might also be issues that'd be really well thought through before we. 
we head in that direction. Sure, so. but, but if you look at uh, what Microsoft has done over the years, mm. they've taken C Sharp and they have introduced a fairly decent amount of reification into it, not, not perfect mm. yet, but I think there's quite a bit of space before we hit those yeah. problems, I think. Mm. They also have value types. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. What, I, what I would really value out of reification would be, if they sorted it out properly, would be to reincorporate arrays as a reasonable <laughs> data type instead of, the, instead of the current situation where they have a completely different typing system from collections and the whole thing, I mean, that, that, the interoperation of arrays and collections is just a disaster. And I think, and I think quite serious for Java. Well, I'd really like to see that sorted. I, I think that can be resolved independently of going the fuller step to full reification though, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's sort of a special case which would be incredibly useful to Java developers to solve. Um, and it's probably a step that's you know, doable in a reasonable time frame, whereas full reification, I don't think mm, would, even if yeah. we were to go and do it, we probably wouldn't see it until what, 10, 11, yeah. maybe even 12. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it won't be be four, and yeah. there's also other like, things that look like syntactic sugar that actually help you sort out the collection confusion. We're certainly doing uh, object literals for, uh, for yeah. nine, for example. That, that'll really help, yeah, mm -hmm. definitely. Okay, so we got a question from the stream. Mm -hmm. um, somebody was asking, Jim Weaver was asking about reactive programming and whether this Buzz is something... Buzzword of the year. <laughs> whether this is a pattern the Lambdas APIs um, make possible or something which you'd need additional language features to, to do properly with Java. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, anyway, uh, while these guys are, are mulling over it, if you have any questions in the audience, you can either just you know shout them out or raise your hands, or you can tweet to hashtag um, night tacking, um, and then I'm f watching the Twitter stream and I'll um, a ask questions to these guys which come in off Twitter. So yeah. please, hey. uh, I think one of the benefits that we have uh, is really ability to use any library, compile in any language on the JVM. So there's nothing really stops us from using Akka, for example. Uh, from Java or any of the other JVM languages today. So while Lambda Expressions does make life a lot easier, I, I don't think it is uh, any, anything more is needed on the Java side itself. It's more of a library issue, how we design and, and develop applications. It's not a native feature or language you support, but uh, a more of a hygienic uh, interface by a library is more desirable, I think. Yeah, I think it's, it's a sort of natural language evolution, isn't it? You get, you get an idea or a theory, uh, once it's proven itself over time, it tends to get built into a framework, and then maybe years after that, once it's really proven itself as a solid foundation of computer science, it becomes a language feature. So I, I would say it's, it's certainly too early to you know, fully bake in reactive programming ideas in, into the JDK. Um, I, we use Rx Java at JClarity um, quite nicely from Netflix, and that in combination with Lambda's uh, you know, coming up in March will be will solve our problem quite nicely, I think. I, I would also argue that in a way, a language that does a lot ends up being a lot less flexible. So we want to certainly keep the language features to be some, some sort of a core features on, on top of which libraries can be easily built rather than trying to extend the language itself yeah, beyond a certain yeah, level. Yeah. And it's hard to really see where that balances, but it's important not to cross that line and make the language more complex mm -hmm. and then in turn make it less flexible you know, uh, rather than saying, here are these small building blocks, the most essential ones, and then you could build libraries with it. Yeah. It's been a great strength of the Java ecosystem that we do have this amazing ability to build fantastic libraries and frameworks and these building blocks on, on top of the core JVM. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I don't think that Java and the JVM should push too far out into that space either and mm -hmm. sort of you know, stop the creativity of the community. So uh, mm -hmm. I definitely agree. Any more, any more questions from uh, the world? What, what are you staring at, Venka? He had a question for you. Oh, <laughs> we have a question. Yeah. Okay, all right, thank you. Right, and, and in the meantime, we're going to promise all of the features. Mark <laughs> Reinhold <laughs> said <laughs> 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 that everything will be delivered. Uh, well, I guess the standard <laughs> Oracle disclaimer applies. I don't <laughs> make any purchasing decisions yeah. uh, based on anything we say <laughs> because it might not be true. <laughs> <laughs> Especially with, with this regards is to the sort of panel. <laughs> <laughs> this is entertainment, yeah. Mm. Blue sky thinking. Um, if you think this is entertainment, you really need to get out more. Yeah. 
Well, I'm, I'm still quite curious about. Yeah, I, I still want to see see kind of jigsaw take hold in some way, shape, or form. At least to split up the JVM and JDK yep. itself, because it's just yep. even with the compact profiles, it's just too big to, to drive down into embedded properly and things. So, yeah. we should probably also mention jigsaw in the con a context of like. Future okay, so stuff you guys, you guys are yeah. divining what Harmit on the stream. He just asked about Jigsaw. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. So he was wondering how that related. Well, that's going to be the release driver for nine, I, I believe. I mean, uh, no Jigsaw, no nine, just yeah. like Lambdas was for Java eight. Yeah. So it's going to yeah. be one of the more yeah. important things that we do. Yeah. yeah. And I, I would like to see a lot more of the community, certainly in terms of OSGI interop and things like that, get involved really mm -hmm. nice and early. Um, I know there was a, a project called Project Penrose, I think. Yeah. Uh, which was kind of half started last year, um, and I, I think even if Jigsaw arrives, but that sort of interop work isn't done, it's going to be a bit of a disaster on release. Uh, it won't be as well used as it could be. Yeah, Not, nothing is finished yet, but there have been like three restarted uh, prototypes. Uh, proof yes. of concept We're on prototypes. Jigsaw Take Four yeah. now, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 But I mean, yeah. I, I, I welcome the fact that. It seems that Jigsaw is not going to have a big impact on the language. No, I think I think that's a really good thing because I think it's, I think the the changes in uh, in Java eight are going to take some time to settle down. So you, it's, you been, it's been argued a lot that it should be more disruptive, but uh, I think it's a deliberate effort, uh, architecture wise, to keep it um, uh, not pollute the language as much. Yeah, mm. I think it's a good decision. It's pretty good because I mean the, this this enables the embedded world in a completely different light. Do you remember Java uh, JDK 1.0 back in '95? It fit on 1.4 4 megabyte floppy. I could, could carry the entire JDK on a floppy in my yeah. pocket yeah, yeah. and did. And uh, maybe we can get back there for the bare bones. I mean, it's not. Yeah. It's, it's a bit bloated, isn't it, when you download yeah. 400 megs of, 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 and, and of uh, that, it would be file. nice to it would be nice to write hello world and not have it take up 70 meg of, <laughs> yeah, of, of yeah. RAM. You know. It's, yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I think while the size of the JDK is, is something to be concerned about, the, the bigger problem really is the uh, issues people run into the deployment when there is real collisions. Mm. And it, it's just insane to even think that we don't have a proper way to version libraries. I think so. It's a bigger problem that has to be solved for you know, enterprise deployment much more than anything else, I think. Mm. Yeah. OK, so let me. Switch the conversation. So uh, we got a question from the audience, and it was about how, you know, if you look at the evolution of Java, it's getting higher level and more abstract, and you know, a lot of the fundamentals, um, like you know, 10, 20 years ago, you really had to understand how machines worked, how, you know, the underlying code worked on the device to actually do programming, and now you're so far abstracted from it. So are programmers today coming out of schools better or worse off, do you think? I think they're worse off. I mean, <laughs> even though you're on a, on, a, on a fluffy abstract level with the futures and promises and uh, actors and whatever you call it, if you don't understand what's going yeah. on beneath the covers, yeah. you're doomed. Yeah, well, absolutely. I, I, don't, I don't think it's true that we need to know less. I think we need to, I, I mean, I, I Believed for a long time, I knew how computers worked because yeah. I learned it, I learned how computers worked a really long time ago, <laughs> and, it's, um, they, and they actually did work that way for a really for a really long time. Then I woke up a few years ago and I noticed, hey, they've really changed a lot. And I think to be a, to be an effective programmer now, you really do have to learn. I don't think that's changed at all. Yeah. I think it's actually become so become more emphatically the case. Yeah. I've, been, I've been working on performance in a Java project these last two years, but yeah. it was absolutely essential for me to understand how the hardware yeah. architecture below yeah. me worked. Yeah anyway in order to get the performance yeah, yeah, I needed. Yeah. So it's pretty simple. If a higher candidate comes to us and like, yeah, OK, so you did Commodore 64 assembly demos in the 80s, um, he will be good, usually. Yeah. So, so I have a mm. slightly different opinion on it, uh, especially the fact that I actually am a faculty. I would say uh, it, it really depends on the school. And also, I, I don't think it's fair to paint everybody with one brush. Yeah. Think about mm, it, true. for example, in the medical field, there are general practitioners, then there are specialists. And, and there are going to be certain programmers who don't need to go, get to deeper levels. As much mm. as I would desire to myself, I would say they are fine at a higher level. And then there are certain people who really need to go not just one, but maybe several levels of abstraction below and, and really understand the deeper problems. Because not everybody is going to do everything in the world, and it's not yeah. scalable to do that. 
But I would argue that it's sort of upside down, because while a brain surgeon is, is a very specialized thing, you consider it the hardware person. I consider the brain surgeon the Java person, and like going, understanding what the hardware does is being able to, uh, to settle a broken leg, because everyone needs to sort of have some understanding of what's in the machine. There is a register machine below you, and it's not going to go away, no matter how much you abstract it. But sure, there are, I, I, I buy the argument that there are specializations. Sure. But sooner or later, you sit there with a core file and the customer is screaming at you. What are you going to do? So. Right. Well, but, but I think from the education <laughs> point of view, some of the flaws I see today is quite a significant number of students not even knowing what a command prompt really is. To yeah. me, that's very dangerous. That's no argument terrifying. there. Yeah. Absolutely not. Mm. Yeah. And, and the other thing I would say is, one of the things I've been trying to uh, reset the clock is, when students come out of a four-year degree, Programming in either one language or one type of language, it's extremely dangerous. I would also blame the computer industry for that. It's been on the internet. I mean, if you hire painters, you don't ask how much brown they worked with, which is yeah. like what they do when they yeah, say yeah. how much, how many codes of C have you written in your life, or like, sure. do you know Java EE? Right. These so, are tools. These are not the job. Right. They're, I would yeah. argue that they should really uh, be uh, exposed to, to a fairly good extent at least mm. three or four fundamentally different you know, types yeah. of programming. Yeah. Mm. And, and then they get to decide which one they can have a preference over. But, Absolutely. But, yeah. but yeah. learning one thing really good shouldn't be at the expense of ignoring and being ignorant no, about the other yeah. things. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. if you have right. to teach them only one language, it's like to be Lisp. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, I mean, I think for the Java developer today, because Java has moved away further and further from, from the bare metal, and it's starting to creak and groan under the weight of that a little bit, so in the good old days, things like JIT and the garbage collector would more or less just take care of these problems for you, but you know, with, with the hardware having changed so radically under our, under our feet, and with the amount of data that we're now pushing through applications, I think at least for the next four to five years, Java developers are going to have to understand at least a little bit of what goes on under the hood until you know, Marcus actually you know, finishes all that good work he's supposed to be doing. And uh, it makes, makes the JVM sort of automatically adapt to these conditions again. So you, you've got a small, bit of, small amount of work still to do. <laughs> yeah. I, I sort of computed what my hourly wage is uh, given the amount of time I worked last week, and it was a bit discouraging. Yeah, that's good. Well, m maybe, maybe Larry will let you go on his yacht for, uh, for a week as a holiday. Yeah, that'll be yeah. there. <laughs> but but, but to, to make a counter argument to what, what I said earlier to myself, uh, one thing that does shift this quite significantly, maybe not necessarily down to the register level, but is to understand what uh, impact multi core processors are going to really have. Yes. I think that makes a huge difference, not having any clue about what threading is and why things mm. shape differently on a multi-core yeah. versus a single processor can be really disastrous for that brain surgeon who's a Java programmer yeah. that you mentioned. Yeah. That would make a big difference. Thre threading is a false god. I mean, it doesn't exist on the higher abstraction levels with uh, pure parallelism, and it doesn't exist on the silicon either. Right. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so one of the questions we got on the stream, and this is kind of taking what we've been talking about for lambdas and APIs to the next abstraction layer, which is a lot of Java developers are actually Java EE developers. So what, does, what do the new APIs, the new language features mean for folks who are developing on, on enterprise Java? In Java 8, we have done a lot of metadata and annotations. There are various mm. like annotation containers that weren't there before, etc. I mean, I know very little about Java EE. To me, Java EE seems to be you have a jar file and you use reflection to introspect it for annotations. And, and that's as far as I understand Java EE. So yeah. someone else should, yeah. should ask that question. So. Well, so fundamentally, if you really look at Java EE, uh, I probably have a little bit of a pessimist, pessimistic view but most of what Java EE is doing is to protect programmers from really hurting themselves. Yeah. You know, hey, you can't be doing threading after all, it's too complex, we'll take care of that in the container. So I'm hoping with uh, more immutability that becomes a more, more of a practice with Lambda expressions, uh, we could be able to use, uh, build applications with less reliance on those containers, maybe uh, become more lightweight, I would say, than, than yeah. Would, yeah. What, what we have yeah. right now. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the effect would be that the containers will just become less of an obstacle. So it for sounds what you're like doing. you guys yeah. are all pretty much agreeing that as the Java language evolves, you need less and less of the you specialty. Need, yeah, you need less ceremony around the EU yeah. stuff. Yeah. 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 Well, in a way, it's like looking at design patterns, right? The more patterns we have, is a reflection on the quality or the lack thereof of the language. 
And, and a better language actually requires a lot fewer external patterns to be applied. OK, so let me give you guys another zinger. So should in future, in our, in our future Java, is there a reason why we would want to break backwards compatibility? Uh, yes. <laughs> oh, there are plenty of reasons why we would want to. <laughs> Shouldn't you? Yeah. Is There's it, nothing is it, we can ever, ever do. We, <laughs> I mean, sure, everyone fantasizes about it. Scala rewrites everything every half hour, but we simply cannot afford to. If we lose uh, the concept that that class file that you built in 1996 doesn't run with the newest JVM, we will lose our market share. I, I, I will argue one point on that. I think security should trump compatibility. Yes. On the yeah. other hand, if you want security, upgrade to Java instead of running that Java 131 that your banking system in Japan yeah. has spent the last 10 years oh, as yeah, an execution yeah, environment yeah, with. Yeah, so. yeah. I also think with, with the introduction of Jigsaw, the, the idea of being a little bit more flexible about compatibility, you know, it, it opens up the discussion, I think. Mm. Uh, but we'll, see, we'll yeah, see. Sure. But I mean, backwards compatibility is one of the more important things that gives us oh, huge, market share hugely today. important. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, definitely. Well, oh. I, I think while it's it's certainly got value, I think we have to compare that to the cost of providing. Right. It, it, it's 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 a it's a fact in life that when we ask for something, we always give up something else. And by asking for a backward compatibility as far back as 1.0. Yeah, yeah. There's a huge amount of things we are giving up. So at some point, we got to decide how yeah. far backward is backward compatibility reasonable enough. So, I mean, deprecation stuff, I mean, surely we can remote thread stop now. It's 2014. I mean, that, yeah, that's yeah. one thing that we will, I mean, that's not what I mean when I say that we have to maintain backwards compatibility. Yeah, that that would so, be nice. Yeah, but a serious, seriously breaking backward compatibility would mean forking Java. And, yeah. I mean, and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm not convinced that the world will be a better place yeah, if, if, you, if Java's forked. I don't think so. No. But if you're using a deprecated API, it has been deprecated for like three Java generations. Uh, I mean, or more. really, <laughs> stop doing that. Yeah, it would be nice to remove those. Could start yeah, annotating Java util date with deprecated as well. Yeah. Get rid of it in 2020. Well, I, I would ask, is yes. 1.5 uh, far enough to look back, or should we even look back beyond that? Well, I, I still see a lot of code in the wild running 1.4. I mean, that's a problem, right? But you yeah. know, large old old enterprises who built one Java app back in the day, and that's kind of their equivalent of the mainframe or the COBOL system yeah. that was there earlier. And they wrote it once, and they just have never touched it again. Yeah. Um, so yeah. uh, it'd be interesting to do a, a, a proper industry survey on how much of it's out there, but I bet you there's probably still quite a lot. Yeah. Mm. So I guess the question would be, for somebody running on pre 1.5, are they going to upgrade their production systems to run Java 8? No, but no. I mean, there is a limit to where our responsibility ends <laughs> if, if they don't. Right, yeah. We can't guarantee, I mean, that's end of life su the support wise as well now. We can't guarantee that you'll have like every security update, everything will backwards compatible, everything will work. I mean, if you just, from your side as well, keep upgrading your systems, I mean, no harm will come to you. Whereas for Scala, it's like, okay, I've a new dot version, not, nothing runs. So that's difference is there. Right? Okay. So going back to something we talked about earlier, you got you were chatting about having more, um, you know, bare metal performance. Oh, it's not quite bare metal, but closer to the yeah, native stack. Yeah, close to anyway. bare metal. Yeah. So um, what do you guys think about exposing more of the hardware details to Java applications, like you know, number of cores or specific details about the hardware where you could tune the program? Is that going too far with that get away from the portability of Java, or is it something which needs to happen for Java it's programs? It's not to necessarily going too far. Um, we already exposed difference. I mean, the original Java 1 had just one mouse event because Macs were the least common denominator with one mouse button <laughs> and stuff like that. And I mean, we have to expose some of the things for the user, I think. Uh. But uh, exposing the core and say peek and poke here in, in memory is yeah. a different thing altogether. The ideal has to be that we, were going, that we shouldn't want to expose more of the hardware than we, than we no. have to because the JVM should be, the, 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 the VM, use the VM should be able to take advantage of it for us. The dream use case is you write like parallel stream and it will use the correct number of cores for yeah, you and you absolutely. shouldn't have to care. Absolutely. But I mean, I can understand that in some cases you want to know more about the machine you're running on. But yeah. uh, the question is, 
often, I mean, it's usually a good way of shooting yourself in the foot to try to work around the VM or fool the VMs. Yeah. You have to know what you're doing. People have system GCs in strange places, which no. sometimes force full yeah. GCs to do strange things with yeah. references. Yeah. They do object pooling, which just floods up the old space on the heap, and they think they're clever by reusing these. Say, I mean, th yeah. this, is, this is dangerous ground with mines in it, so you have to, you have to be careful. But just reading, like, system properties, I don't see the harm in that, because sometimes it's even useful in, in, in different environments. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, something else we talked about before was tail recursion as something which might be interesting. Are there any other specifically JVM language features which you guys think are important going forward? Things that would change in the, um, the core virtual machine. So I, I mentioned one thing that I don't think we're going to get for a very long time, but I'm a big fan of metaprogramming. So uh, if there's a way to do uh, uh, decent metaprogramming with Java, I would be definitely excited, but I know I'm, <laughs> it's a bit full thinking. <laughs> yeah, they, they just added a whole metaprogramming thing to Scala in, in the past year or two, and yeah. that, that was um, controversial even for the Scala community, the amount of flexibility it opened up for people to shoot themselves in the foot. Well, right. there, there's al always going to be people who are fearful of it, and I can never convince myself avoiding a language feature for the sake of fear uh, I think the flexibility should be in the hands of people who are qualified enough to use it. But, but having the flexibility can open up so much more to develop lightweight tools and libraries and framework that is not so easy to do today in Java. Yeah. And so many security bugs. But yes, I agree. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let me switch topics to how folks can get involved. So you, you mentioned JEPS, Java Enhancement Proposals. Yep. So for somebody who doesn't work for Oracle as a, a JVM language hacker, what, what sort of ways can they help to contribute to the, the future Java? Let the London jug talk. Yeah. I mean, that's the prime <laughs> example of, of uh, success there that we have with us. Um, so, so there's probably a couple of ways. If, if, if you've got real resources and you've got you know, a really strong academic background in, in language design or VM design, that sort of thing, um, then yeah, sure, go ahead and propose a, a formal research JEP or a, a, even a, a feature JEP, potentially. Mm -hmm. But you have to be prepared, you and your organization, you and your company, to put in some real years of effort, right? Because anything that goes into Java or the JDK or JVM has to be maintained for till the end of time, hopefully, right? And it's a really, really serious commitment. Um, if you want to com contribute on a more casual level, for example, you found a bug in the, in the string, string API or, or in, the, in one of the math libraries or what, what is typically called core libs, I guess, which mm. is just purely Java code itself, uh, then there is a new uh, adoption group within OpenJDK. Um, and basically, there's a, a whole bunch of us Java user groups around the world uh, and some other organizations who have more casual contributors to Java. And uh, we help you um, learn to build Java. We help you provide patches for bug fixes. Um, we help do things now like uh, test the latest builds of Java on all the major open source projects around the world so nobody gets any surprises, um, so on and so forth. So yeah, it's called uh, Adopt Open JDK. And if you just Google for that, you'll find it very easily. Cool. Join the main list. I mean, it's mm. sometimes yeah. scary to just throw out a question that might be deemed stupid on the mailing list, but no one's gonna, no one's gonna yell at you, and, and we're happier for you if you participate. And usually the traffic is high, the turnaround is fast. So, uh, for example, for multi-language, uh, Java is a polyglot platform. We have the MLVM dev list, which we hang around a lot. And uh, mm -hmm. check out the openjdk.net, basically. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to toss out a, a backwards a question on a previous topic because the lag is the stream is slightly delayed in terms of questions. Okay, and then I'm going to give you guys a new topic. So the previous one was actually a comment on metaprogramming from Stuart Marks, and <laughs> <laughs> he's wondering Mr. if Trouble. that includes macros. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I would <laughs> love macros in Java. Sorry, guys, if you want to kill me, I would still love it. I'm not ashamed to say it. Those would be hygienic macros, not I have hygienic absolutely. macros, but still. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm just going to say no. no. Please, please don't do that. All right, so we, 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 we think we have far. a fight brewing on the, on the yeah. panel. We'll yeah. get pissed to come. So are you going to, which side are you on? I'm a, I'm, I'm, well, I'm a, I'm a need to be convinced, for sure. Okay. Yeah. All right, so we, we'll, yeah. we'll, save, we'll save that one for later in the parking lot. Uh. How about, um, so the, 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 um, 
Stuart Maple, who's running the new virtual jug, has a question about Internet of Things. So what sort of capabilities do you need in future Java to support embedded and Internet of Things devices? Uh, needs to get a lot smaller. Yeah. Lower smaller. footprint. <laughs> yeah. Jigsaw yeah. will help with some of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, there's other convergence needs to happen. It needs to, they probably need to rethink uh, again the, the just in time compiler and the support for that. Yeah. Um, also, memory management. So, memory it's, I mean, there are embedded VMs, but they're fairly primitive. I mean, the, I guess the architectural vision, the product management vision, is we can use one code base and compile it for the different tiers, everything between embedded and server. We're, we're away from realizing that dream, but I don't think it's impossible mm. in the long run. Okay, that, that would be a wonderful nirvana, but I can see, for example, you know, the, the new G1 collector that's coming, um, it, it very much is geared towards large heaps, right? So yeah. it, we're, you know, mm. we're not necessarily seeing the same level of effort being put into the embedded side yet. Mm. Not that I'm seeing publicly on the OpenJDK list yeah. and things anyway. I, I appreciate Java embedded has had a lot of work but done. But we have too it. many things that are completely different for the same thing, like it, two completely different compilers. A test matrix is not a matrix, it's like a hypercube. So yeah, we have, yeah. to, um, ha have to unify functionality. And I mean, the product vision is that Embedded and server have more in common. The more and more come together. I, I, I think is that going to include invoke dynamic on, on the embedded? <laughs> Why not? <laughs> yes. That would be awesome. I, I think one of, the, uh, one of the tricks here is to start with the question what has to change to support it rather than saying what should be there to support it and then see how we can use what we have. I think, I think a lot of times we are constrained by what, what we have. And that may not be the right approach to really provide something for a different platform or a, or a new platform. I think the, uh, if you look at it as a pyramid, there's not a whole lot of change that has to happen at the language level, but enormous uh, changes that has to happen at layers below. Yeah. So it is, it is always much Tell worse to <laughs> take what's existing and move it over. Sometimes much easier to just create something brand new and make it efficient and then make sure it compiles the same language syntax down. Why is Stuart Marks even awake, by the way? Isn't it 3 a.m. there? <laughs> Stu Stuart stayed up just to see you guys. Uh, that's very kind. That's how dedicated he is. Hi, Stuart. Hi, Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so to, to, to close out the panel, I want you guys to each think of a presentation title which you'll be giving five years from now. You know, on Java. <laughs> and you can, you can be as creative grandiose or realistic as you want in your title. But, you know, it could come true. I'll just take the easy one. <laughs> Rocking with Java. That Rocking could, with Java. Yeah, it could be anything now. That gives me the flexibility. So you, you, you're, you're taking the easy out. <laughs> That's absolutely. <laughs> Will you still be live coding five years from now? I hope so. We'll see. Next <laughs> on how old I get by then. <laughs> uh, right ones run everything. <laughs> right once run everything. <laughs> yes, that, that, that was an infamous uh, tagline that we had for Java for a number of years. Right once run anywhere. <laughs> you guys need some more time to mull? Uh, uh, you're going yeah. to fight out. How, how Java trumped the JavaScript type. How, nice. how Java trumped the JavaScript type. Any, any, yeah. any applause for that one? <laughs> Ideally, you have to start by explaining what JavaScript was. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. You got the last uh, word, so you Maurice. guys in the IT industry, this JavaScript thing, can, can, can someone come up and tell me why afterwards? Because I, well. <laughs> yeah, it would, be, uh, it would be a story of uh, uh, struggle and survival, I would say. <laughs> struggle, survival, and triumph. That would be like your title? That. Yeah, that'll be my title in Struggle five years' time. Struggle and survival time. I'll, I'll that, go to the that's talk. That's how we go. <laughs> All right, so give our panel a big round of applause. Thank you. And thanks very much for watching. Please enjoy the next JFocus session, which begins in 10 minutes. Oh, I can mute this thing. Bye, Stuart. Yeah, bye, Stuart. Yeah. <laughs>